This week's episode is brought to you by Heimnog. When you need that sexy podcasting voice that will drive all the cadets crazy. Hey there, cadets. Jeff Heimbuck here. Now, a lot of you asked us, Hey, Communicore Weekly, are you going to play the night before Communicore again on this year's holiday episode? And the answer is yes. Yes, we are. Now, even though it does reference Communicore Weekly the musical, which you guys did not know about at that time last year, I think you guys will still enjoy it, and it's still just as relevant today. So enjoy the night before Communicore. Twas the night before Communicore, when all through the house, not a cadet was stirring, not even the mouse. The iPods were connected to the computer with care, in hopes that the holiday episode soon would be there. The cadets were all nestled, all snug in their beds, with visions of bob arounds floating round their heads. Jeff was in his kerchief, George in his cap, both settled their brains for a theme park theme nap. Their stockings were hung, soon to be filled with Disney knowledge, or perhaps a scholarship to Communicore Community College. Outside, on the roof, there came a loud noise, one that awoke all cadet girls and boys. They sprung to the window to see what was the lark that awoke them from dreams of a full day theme park. Down from the chimney came noises so loud, followed shortly after by a puffy dust cloud. A man stood before them, all covered in soot, with a slightly strange creature who sat by his foot. He had a big bushy beard, but was not covered in red. It was not Santa Claus, but Dreamfinder instead. Ho ho, dear figments, what do we have here? He shouted in a voice that rang in quite clear. I know you were expecting another jolly round man, but I wanted to join you and extend my hand. You see, he continued, I have no presents that are solid, but instead wanted to impart just a bit of my knowledge. Imagination, he continued, is what keeps us all living. It's the gift that gives and gives and keeps on with giving. Now Figment and I must go back to the dream port, and I'm sorry for keeping this visit of ours so short. But you should all get going, back into your beds, and wait for the visit from Santa Claus instead. Be good girls and boys, be good little cadets, for you'll need lots of rest for the upcoming threat. But tonight is all about spreading our holiday cheer, for you don't know yet the enemy you'll face early next year. But enough of this talk, enough of my prattle, I wish you the best of luck in the Magic Kingdom battle. He sprang to his dreamcatcher, gave Figment a whistle, and flew away both like a nuclear missile. But we heard him exclaim just before he did go, Happy Holidays to all. Let's get on with the show. Communico Weekly, come and get geeky, bob around boats and five-legged ghosts. Communico Weekly, stockings filled with freaky, waited all week and even said and go. Hello, and welcome to Communicore Weekly, the greatest online show and home of the world's first pair of independently born identical elves. I'm George. And I'm Jeff. And it's our third annual holiday episode here on Communicore Weekly. And in tradition of the holiday spirit, I have a cold, which is why I sound like this. <laughs> it's not from the Heimnog? It is not from all the Heimnog that I have not been drinking. <laughs> Yeah, I guess I'll have to carry most of the show. This might be one of the worst shows we ever have then. Uh, uh, we can't say to... that. We have to be cheerful for the holiday oh, spirit, positive, George. And exciting. Yes, come you on. Know. Where's your what? holiday spirit, man? <laughs> Tonight you're going to be visited by the ghost of Communicore past, present, and future. <laughs> Great. So we finally got the swan boat time travel working. Exactly. Totally. Okay. So you're going to be visited by Smart One. Yeah. And then I guess I'm present. And then the future will probably be Michael Eisner. Of course, of course. Just we wearing that hood that. and everything. <laughs> he won't say anything. He'll sense. just point at stuff. He'll just point at He'll stuff. He'll point at some of his favorite plants. <laughs> his favorite plants or all the hotel rooms that he built. Probably that second one's the more likely and of the two scenarios. And all the gift shops. Yes. And Disneyland Paris. Yes. And Celebration. Well, anyway, yeah, we could keep going on and on and on. So, but, all right, let's get this uh, crazy holiday show going. 
it's time for Disney History. Every year, the Osborne family spectacle of dancing lights entertains millions of guests with its display of Christmas lights and decorations at Disney's Hollywood Studios, America's favorite half-day park. <laughs> <laughs> now, the show was initially constructed by an Arkansas businessman as a gift for his six-year-old daughter, but has now grown into one of the most popular attractions during the park's holiday season. So Jennings Osborne, along with his wife Mitzi, founded the Arkansas Research Medical Testing Center in Little Rock, Arkansas in 1968. The business's success allowed him and his wife to eventually purchase a large estate in the middle of town in 1976. In 1980, the Osbournes had a daughter, Allison Brianne Osborne, nicknamed Breezy. Now, well, why is this important? Well, in 1986, Breezy asked her father if they could decorate their home in lights for the holidays. Now, Osborne, being the great father that he was, strung a thousand lights around their home. And then each year after that, the display just got bigger and bigger. And eventually, Osborne purchased the two properties adjacent to his own and expanded the display onto them. By 1993, the display had over 3 million lights. Some of the more prominent features included an illuminated globe with Little Rock and Bethlehem marked uh, mounted in the backyard, two rotating carousels of light placed on each end of the estate's circular driveway, a 70-foot tall Christmas tree of lights with 80,000 lights in three colored layers mounted atop the home's kitchen, and a canopy of 30,000 red lights over a section of the driveway. That is a lot of lights. <laughs> yes, it is. Now, the lights were extremely popular in both Arkansas and around the world, as news crews often visited to film the display. And since their house was located in one of the busiest streets in Little Rock, it eventually caused severe traffic issues and lots and lots of complaints. Like we mentioned earlier, the display grew bigger and bigger every year, and by 1993, it was lit for 35 days during the Christmas season, from sunset to about midnight every day. Six neighbors filed a lawsuit saying traffic congestion made trips to the corner store take two hours, and they feared emergency vehicles could not get down the street. Osborne responded by adding three million more lights. That seems like the only logical thing to do at that point in time. <laughs> so the county court ordered an injunction against the display and they limited it to 15 days and directed it only be open from 7 p.m. to 10.30 p.m. And Osborne actually appealed first to the Arkansas Supreme Court and then lost and then in 1994 to the United States Supreme Court where Justin Clarence Thomas refused to halt the order. And then in 1995, the state Supreme Court shut down the, the display altogether. However, the Osbournes continued to have a light display, but on a much smaller scale, well into the 2000s. The story of the lights display's uh, court case brought national attention, including offers from several cities to host the display. Walt Disney World project director John Phelan contacted Osborne's attorney about moving the display to the Orlando Resort and eventually discussed the potential move with Osborne himself. Now, of course, when Disney calls, anybody's going to answer. So Osborne <laughs> was intrigued by the offer, but initially understood that Disney wanted to put the display on another residential street in Orlando, which is where he became a little hesitant about the, about the deal. What Phelan actually offered was to install the display on residential street, in quotation marks, the back lot section at Disney's Hollywood Studios, which uh, at the time was known as Disney MGM Studios. Now, being a fan of the resort himself and realizing where the display would actually go, Osborne accepted Disney's offer. So in 1995, the display was set up on residential street as the Osborne family spectacle of lights, becoming an immediate success. Residential Street was visited during the Backlot Tours tram vehicles. Uh, when the light display was in place, however, the tram tours would stop before sunset, allowing guests to walk among the displays. Initially, the display was purely the original lights from the Osborne Estate, but in subsequent years, the display was augmented to its current size of over 5 million lights. The display's uh, Disney caretakers have also added a number of hidden Mickeys into the lights. 
Now, the display is made up of over 10 miles of rope lighting connected by another 30 miles of extension cords. That just seems like an electrician nightmare to me. Mm -hmm. I would hate yes, that. Yes, it does. <laughs> so all the extension cords and the lights were all to hold together by 2 million ties. And it, it takes about uh, 20,000 man hours to install the display each holiday season starting in September. And the lights are turned on at dusk each night starting at mid-November and running into the first week of January and require 800,000 watts of electricity. Wow. Okay, so in 2004, the park began construction on a new arena for its upcoming Lights, Motors, Action, Extreme Stunt Show set to open in 2005. Part of the construction included the demolition of Residential Street, thus necessitating another move of the display. The solution was to move it to another part of the park, the New York Street set, now known as the Streets of America, as part of the move. The studios added an artificial snow effect to the display made up of 33 snow machines that use 100 gallons of fluid per evening. So in 2005, Sylvania became the presenting sponsor of the lights as part of their parent company Siemens' long-term sponsorship deal with the Walt Disney Company's theme parks, which also included Spaceship Earth and Illuminations Reflection of Earth at Epcot. So for the 2006 edition, the park added over 1,500 dimmer relay circuits and control switches to the display to enable the lights to dim on and off electronically. And the relays were choreographed to a musical score, and the display was giving its current name that it currently has now. In 2011, the display had a major overhaul as all the lights were swapped out for LED lights. During this overhaul, the lighting control was updated to a state-of-the-art entertainment lighting system using light control boards from the company Light-O-Rama. This means all the previously choreographed dancing sequences had to be redone. The production team wanted to change one more major element to the display, the canopy. The canopy in previous years was all red and separated into uh, only eight circuits, four on each side. Now each light has three completely controllable LEDs, red, green, or blue, giving the canopy an almost video-like appearance. Now the canopy has 21,600 pixels capable of over 16 million colors. In 2013, Siemens took over the sponsorship, replacing Sylvania, the company's Ford's former subsidiary. And in 2014, reserved viewing of the lights was offered for the first time as part of a Frozen holiday uh, premium package themed around the hit film and Maelstrom Killer Frozen. But that's a story for <laughs> another time altogether. <laughs> Maelstrom Killer. Well done. That's what um, it means. <laughs> well, we would love to know your thoughts on the uh, Osborne Spectacle of Dancing Lights. Um, is that one of your favorite times of year? Do you love it? Do you visit it every year? Is our favorite part of the display that you like? Give us a call on the Communicore Weekly Goat Line at 424-785-4628. That's 424-785-GOAT. You don't know what you know till we know you. You, know, you just don't know. There's one little fact we bet you did it. One little fact we bet you did it. No. In 1972, the Candlelight Processional took place on December 16th and December 17th for two nights only. And here's a direct quote. On December 16th and 17th only, the Magic Kingdom will host a special Candlelight Processional at 7 p.m. down Main Street. A narration of the Christmas story by actor Cary Grant, followed by the lighting of a living Christmas tree, will climax each processional program. Now we know you. He's a nerd, he's a geek, he's a geek, but we all like to hear him speak. So listen up to the words from his speech. Ah! It's George's Book of the Week. This week's book is Christmas at Walt Disney World, an unofficial pictorial of the Christmas season through the years at the parks and resorts by Denise Prescott. This book was released in 2011 and is 96 pages. Uh, when I first reviewed the book many, many years ago, uh, my first impression was that it was going to be a fairly quick read uh, since it was just shy of 100 pages. And I know that Denise worked closely with her husband to select the appropriate photos from her archive of more than 500,000 pictures. Uh, and that was back in 2011. Uh, and in this book, there are actually over 200 photos featured. And with about three to five pictures per page, there's plenty to look at. Uh, my, my biggest complaints about the book are that I really wanted more photos and I wanted them to be bigger 
and slightly better quality. I questioned Denise about this a few years ago and she assured me that the next set of books would be a larger format and have more photos. Unfortunately, there's not been another edition of it. So this is what you'll have to grab if you if it sounds interesting to you. Uh, Christmas at Walt Disney World is the book is more like a fond look back at holiday experiences and sort of what to expect if you were going to go during the 2011 holiday season. If you have a Spumbo so, time machine, you could totally go back you still. Do, and do it again, exactly. Okay, so uh, Denise basically looks at each theme park and the, the major resorts themselves, and there are some real hidden gems in the book. Uh, she looks at current Christmas displays from 2011, but also takes us back to earlier years. Uh, remember the Lights of Winter from Epcot? Uh, the model train that was at the Disney MGM Studios? I actually talked about the Glendale Studios. Um, there are a lot of little hidden details about the books as well, and there's, there's pretty much something for everyone in this book. Whether you're an infrequent visitor or more of the hardcore Disney enthusiasts, um, it, 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 this at the time was a great title for anyone that loves the holidays of Walt Disney World. Um, it's also a great book to give to people who are getting ready to travel with their time machines. Ha ha! Oh yeah. Um, I just got to add that part in there. But it, it was sort of at the time, sort of like a primer that somebody would have used. Um, I, you know, one of the things I thought about when I was reading the book that, you know, young children at the time would really have enjoyed it um, sort of to hype up if they were going to uh, Walt Disney World during the Christmas season. Uh, overall, I thought, you know, it's, it's a pretty good book, a uh, first book, especially one that features so many photographs. Uh, the, as I mentioned earlier, the, the quality of the printing was kind of off even for, uh, for back then. But it's, it's less of an issue as you go through the book. You tend to appreciate the photos that are represented because there's so many historical photos itself. Um, I do want larger photos in the future, if that ever happens, but I don't think it's going to. Uh, <laughs> but again, they've captured so many uh, details, it's really hard to imagine what might have been left out. Uh, at the time, the retail price was $22.95, and that is pretty expensive. Uh, for a paperback book, but I think it's the the way that they chose to publish it and print it makes it a little bit more expensive. And you know, it, it's a good book to buy if you want something that looks back at the 2011 holiday season and uh, some of the hidden details or previous Christmases. And you might be thinking, what's important about a 2011 Christmas? Well, you know, we've talked about why we should be collecting these books, especially the historical ones, because there's not many other resources out there that promote it or talk about it or discuss it. So, you know, as I say, it's 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 hard to find Christmas books <laughs> every year when it runs around. I'm kind of wondering what Jeff's going to want me to do. Uh, but this one was Christmas at Walt Disney World by Denise Prescott. If it's a legend that you seek, come on and take a peek at the window of the week. On our other holiday episodes, we talked about some of the things hidden in the windows during the Osborne family spectacle of Dancing Lights. During the 2014 version of the show, a new window has appeared. If you look at the building that the Star of David is on, you'll notice a fire escape. Now, if you look a little closer at the window uh, that's right next to the fire escape, you'll actually see a rabbit who was formerly accused of murder. Now, nothing quite says the holiday spirit like murder, in my personal opinion. Um, <laughs> but yes, you also see Robert Roger Rabbit peering out of one of the windows, enjoying the spectacle of lights, uh, probably after, uh, you know, Doom tried to kill him. That's why he's so happy. He doesn't have to run away from him any longer. Or they were playing patty cake. They could have been playing patty cake. Sometimes you might see it, sometimes you don't. Hey, look, what's that? It's a five-legged goat. The canopy at the Osborne Family Spectacle of Dancing Lights is always a surefire hit with everyone. Each year, the LED color-changing lights dance along with the music, making it quite the sight. This year, What's This from The Nightmare Before Christmas was added to the playlist. Now, why is this important? Now, forget about Hidden Mickeys, and we are going to talk about Hidden Lincolns at a later date, but more importantly right now, we're talking about Hidden Jack Skellingtons this year. So, right at the end of the song, you'll see Jack's face appear on the canopy, but look quickly, because he'll be gone before you know it. I mean, did you really see him, or was it just your imagination? And consider this chilling challenge, this canopy has no windows and no doors, but it is see-through, and you can get out on both ends, so 
it's really not that big of a deal really <laughs> I wasn't gonna laugh until I heard you try to say those lines <laughs> did, it, did it work with this voice was it did it oh, sound creepier I think it was absolutely fantastic are you patronizing me no 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 not at all why He's would I pay you me, for guys. anything <laughs> I wouldn't pay for anything well anyway fair enough uh, fair it, enough yeah <laughs> <laughs> that was it was a good spooky ending to this christmas episode <laughs> yeah that doesn't make a lot of sense now does it i just miss halloween i guess that's probably all it is <clears throat> well you know people can tell us what they thought about your voiceover because they can call the goat line they can call the goat line yes and tell us what you think about the heimnog and if you should drink more of it oh geez um, <laughs> oh okay guys well Thank you so much for watching and listening to another episode of Communicore Weekly. Please leave us a comment and give us a rating on iTunes. And don't forget, we are coming up on the end of Season 3. So email us at communicoreweekly at gmail.com. Don't forget, we're looking for your name, your birthday and month, and your postal or snail mail address. You can send those to communicoreweekly at gmail.com, and we promise some surprises. Coming soon. And of course, like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash Weekly. And follow us on Twitter and Instagram. I'm at Imagineerding and he's at Jeff Heimbuck. And of course, give us a call and leave us a voicemail on the Communicore Weekly GOAT line at 424-785-4628. And don't forget, you can visit Spotify and Google Play to listen to Communicore Weekly the Musical for free or support the Communicore Weekly Orchestra and purchase your copy on iTunes CD Baby and Amazon. And of course, visit the Communa store at communicorweekly.com. Click on the store link and check out some of our cool t shirts. For Jeff Heimbuck, I'm George Taylor. And for George Taylor, I'm Jeff Heimbuck with a terrible voice. Thanks so much for listening to our third annual holiday episode of Communicor Weekly. We'll see you next time for the greatest online show. <laughs> <laughs>